There we go. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and welcome to the first museum talk of 2024. Thank you for coming. My name is Emma Bauer and I am the program coordinator at the Osgoode Township Museum and your organizer for tonight's talk. In addition to our speaker, we're also joined by James Jensen, our executive director. He is in the chat somewhere. Um, please know that we are recording this talk and it will be made available on our YouTube in the next few days. Before I hand things off to Holly, I'd like to acknowledge that the Osgoode Township Museum, which is located in Vernon, Ontario, just south of Ottawa, is on the traditional unceded ancestral land of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Algonquin and Anishinaabe are the original inhabitants of this territory along the Ottawa, Rideau, and Castor Rivers, and have lived on this land since time immemorial. We are grateful to have the opportunity to be present uh, in this territory. The Osgoode Township Museum, like I said, is located in Vernon, Ontario, in the southernmost part of Ottawa, and has been operating as a museum since 1973. The OTM tells the story of Ottawa's agricultural and rural heritage in the former Osgoode Township. If you visit the OTM during the spring, summer, or the fall, you'll get the chance to wander around the grounds, visit the 10,000 square foot heritage garden that is modeled after a 1907 school garden, and the main museum building houses an eclectic collection of approximately 10,000 artifacts. The artifacts in our collection range from 3D objects uh, like everyday household items such as potato mashers to full-size tractors and threshing mills. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. Um, the talk is scheduled to be about an hour, which includes time set aside at the end for questions and answers. Uh, you may type your questions in the chat throughout the presentation, and then I'll read them to Holly at the end. And like I said, the talk is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube for later access. Today we're joined by Holly Benison. Um, Holly is in her final semester of her MA degree in public history at Carleton University. She is researching and studying Canadian culinary history and how historians can use social, social media platforms to teach and disseminate history. She's passionate about learning historical skills, historical cooking, and critical approaches to living history. I'm also privileged to work alongside Holly in our classes together, and I'm incredibly excited to hear all about her research tonight. If you'd like to learn more about Holly's MA project, look for The Backwoods Kitchen on YouTube. And with all that said, I will gladly pass things off to Holly. There we go. All right, it's time for me to share my screen. <laughs> Alrighty, and go ahead, present. There we go. Okay, well, welcome to Cooking the Backwoods Way. As Emma said, this is really going to be an exploration of all of the research that I've been working on. So I'm really excited to be chatting about my thesis project. I've been working on this for a couple of years now, and uh, I've broken down the presentation into a few different parts. So I'll, I'll introduce myself a bit more in depth and kind of how I came to do this project. Um, and I'm going to chat a bit more about what exactly is the field of culinary history and how this subfield of history is why or sort of what I'm using to research my topic. And then finally, I'm hoping to impart some of the lessons that I've learned and sort of what's next for me and the Backwoods Kitchen. So as Emma mentioned, my name is Holly and I'm currently doing my MA at Carleton in public history. And before Carleton, I completed a graduate certificate in museum management and curatorship at Fleming College, and I received an honors BA from Bishop's University in history. So I've been doing history and museum things for quite some time now, and it's a really exciting field that always has stuff going on. And my project really falls within this idea of living history. So my introduction to living history and working in museums came from volunteer experiences in high school, as well as my work as a sergeant in the Fort York Guard in Toronto, which is a, an immersive War of 1812 militia regiment operating out of Fort York. So living history is the act of exploring a historical period, often through costume, as well as the development of a variety of historical skills, such as cooking, sewing, dancing, or other artisanal skills like leather work or yarn spinning, just to name a couple of examples. And it's a method of learning about history that relies on the researcher applying source-based research and doing things in real life. So in this photo, for example, you can see me standing in the back of the field, uh, giving 
commands for the regiment for a light infantry tactic as a demonstration to the public in the summer of 2021 while we were at the fort. And not only did I do military living history here, but I had a number of chances to work in the historic 1826 officer's kitchen. And this kitchen is a bit unique because it was its sole purpose was just to cook dinner. So imagine having, having one kitchen just for dinner as a meal and a different kitchen for breakfast. That was kind of what we were dealing with here. And uh, this wasn't my first experience cooking on a hearth, as surprise, surprise, as young as 15 years old, I went to a museum camp in Toronto, and that's where I actually learned where, how to hearth cook for the first time. And so having that exposure to living history at such a young age planted the seed in my head that this was a technique worth exploring and largely formed my own philosophy around learning by doing. And my approach to history has been guided by this principle since then. And obviously not all history can be explored this way, but when I can, I do. So how does this tie in with what we're talking about today? There's kind of a lot of different subjects I'm gonna be uh, weaving in. So when I started the process of applying for the MA program, I knew I wanted to do a slightly unconventional project, uh, which would build on my background in living history, as well as at the time, a burgeoning interest in making educational videos for my YouTube channel, which just started, I really started using that as a platform in my second year of my undergrad. So with those kinds of ideas, the Backwoods Kitchen as a concept was born. The concept for the project uh, was that it would be a video-based episodic exploration of the recipes in the Female Emigrant's Guide, a cookbook written by the English settler author Catherine Partrail in 1854. The guide was intended to be an all-in-one manual for women immigrating to Canada, uh, full of not only recipes, but social customs, agricultural advice, and ethnographic observations on Indigenous agricultural systems. Catherine Partrail uh, and her sister, Susanna Moody, both settled in the Peterborough, uh, Nogajiwanong area, so they were largely interacting with their Anishinaabe neighbours. And many of their writings include observations about these relationships that they had. So in each episode, I would cook one recipe from the book, demonstrating the historical skills needed, as well as providing a bit more of a background on the recipe and ingredients as they related more broadly to Canadian history. And since the cookbook was published in Ontario, a lot of the content relates specifically to Ontario. Um, so shown here on these images is a raspberry pie that I did for my MA proof of concept, which is a 10 minute video that had about five recipes prepared called A Victorian Picnic at Bradley House. Um, so that's, you can see that on the top left. And then the top right is venison soup. Bottom is raspberry vinegar, which is actually a drink, and then pumpkin pie. So all of these recipes are from the guide. So I've been a big fan of other immersive history channels such as Townsend's, English Heritage, and Early American. And if any of you watch these channels, like this content will be really familiar to you. Um, but in large part, my explorations of immersive Canadian historical content online were slim. There aren't many projects like this focusing on Canada. And I had a strong desire to continue this sort of virtual telling of culinary history from a distinctly Canadian perspective. And that's what solidified my drive to work with social media and specifically the YouTube platform. Okay, so I've been saying culinary history, culinary this, culinary that, but what exactly is culinary history? Um, I wanted to just kind of explore this idea a little bit, just to kind of give you guys an idea of the scaffolding that really forms my main course of study, what it's like working with a cookbook, and how does that fall uh, under this topic. So this is the definition from Cambridge University Press, and I like it because it covers quite a wide range of what culinary history can be about. So culinary history studies the origins and development of the foodstuffs, equipment and techniques of cookery, the presentation and eating of meals, and the meanings of these activities to the societies that produce them. So fairly wide kind of area of research that can be done through the culinary history lens. So culinary history in Canada has been a growing field since the 80s at least, with authors studying Canadian cookbooks, immigrant social histories, restaurants, dining styles, recipe deep dives, cooking techniques, and recipe translations. The Culinary Historians of Canada is an amazing resource for the advocacy, promotion, and research, and resource sharing in this field. 
And so pictured here, the under Canadian Cookbooks Online is one of their projects where they've digitized quite a few uh, Canadian cookbooks that are in the public domain as PDFs, and they're freely available to conduct your own research with. So that's just one angle of culinary history. Um, the two images are from a War of 1812 event that I attended back in September, and I was doing a cooking demonstration. So on the fire, I was preparing a soup one day, and then the second day, I used a cast iron pot to prepare a sort of curried vegetable dish. And I took the lid, flipped it upside down, and put it on the coals to reheat some ham. And what I was talking about was really looking at these ingenious ways that um, women especially were preparing foods and cooking in sort of wartime when you really had to bring your kitchen with you. So having a multi-purpose tool like this was not only a new technique for me that I was exploring, but a really cool way to talk to the public about why I have a like frying pan lid in the fire. <laughs> Um, and then the last example at the bottom is a article from Fiona Lucas uh, in the Canadian History Magazine, also about culinary history. So there's a lot of different ways that this field is being researched and being presented uh, currently in Canada. So one of the skills, the key skills in working with historic recipes is learning how to translate them because oftentimes they don't include precise measurements or instructions. And if you're looking at historic recipes, most often there aren't even instructions at all. So one such translation project that I undertook just to kind of continue practicing this was working on deciphering the recipes from a 1911 culinary manuscript that I purchased for my collection. And as with any skill, the more you practice, the easier it becomes as you begin to adopt a better understanding of the techniques and methods of cooking from the past. So every recipe that I made for the Backwoods Kitchen was translated in the sense that I experimented with the recipe at home to get precise measurements, as well as figure out what temperatures to cook things at now that we have reliable heat sources like stovetops and ovens. And doing this translation was important for two reasons. The first was so that I could prepackage all my ingredients to bring to the location. But the other reason was because these recipes are available on my website. So for my viewers who watch an episode and they really want to try something out at home, the recipe is there for them to do in a standardized way. So it makes kind of preparing these recipes outside of the context of my project really easy for other people to do too. So with all of that background, I'm excited to get more into the specifics of the project itself. Uh, this is the Backwoods Kitchen logo that my partner designed for me. And I think it really encapsulates sort of what I'm attempting to do, highlighting a lot of these everyday tools that don't often get that same recognition in history as sort of other topics. So each episode, like I mentioned, attempts to tell a story about a recipe from the guide, uh, adapted to suit Canadian seasons, environments, and the usage of Indigenous-derived foodways and products. And so far, uh, of my episodes, I've made raspberry vinegar, which is a drink, pumpkin pie, green corn patties, which is essentially a fried corn pancake, and actually one of the earliest recipes I learned when I first started to cook on the hearth. Preserved apples, which were apples boiled in a brown sugar syrup, so you can preserve them for the whole winter. But be warned, they are very, very sweet. And I used half the sugar she recommended, and it was, it was too much for me, and I have a sweet tooth. Um, and then the last two were a venison soup and the common bush tea cakes, which were essentially a maple shortbread cookie. And over the course of the series, I've attempted to select recipes that will cover a variety of types of meals and foods. So meals from breakfast to dinner, dessert and preserves. And kind of with that in mind, uh, to give an example of my approach, I have for us the most recent episode that we can watch um, together just to kind of exemplify what it is that I've been spending all my time working on. So without further ado, here is the maple cookie, maple shortbread, common bush tea cakes episode. It was only a matter of time before I made a recipe with Canada's most recognizable food, maple. Maple sap is turned into syrup by boiling it. It takes about 45 liters of sap to make just one liter of syrup and can further be refined into sugar granules if desired. 
Trail refers to this as homemade sugar, and while it could be produced locally, the labor required was more than what most settlers were willing to put in. Welcome to the Backwoods Kitchen. I'm your host, Holly Benison, and on today's episode, I'll be baking a batch of common bush tea cakes from the Female Emigrant's Guide. Maple syrup and sugar weren't just innocuous ingredients on a pantry shelf or a trading item. A common misconception that I've heard from guests while working in museums is that Canada was naturally prone to abolitionist views because we could easily boycott plantation-made sugar by prioritizing locally made maple sugar. As early as 1824, American farming manuals were pointing out this connection as well, with one author stating that, as good white sugar can be made of maple as of cane sugar, what a value would not be added to it by the reflection upon the different manner in which these kinds of sugar are produced. The cane sugar is the result of the forced labor of the most wretched slaves, toiling under the ardent rays of a burning sun, and too often under the cruel lash of a cutting whip, while the maple sugar is made by those who are happy and free. So while this argument existed in agriculture and abolitionist circles, it is only a small footnote in Canada's broader history around slavery. In the scenarios that I've heard this argument deployed, it's come off as more of a myth than anything. Nevertheless, it would be an interesting thread to continue researching. As with many of the recipes in this series, this ingredient is also derived from indigenous foodway practices. Springtime is usually associated with the production of maple syrup as the temperatures warm up enough to allow the sap to flow more freely through the tree. Syrup and sugar were highly valued because they would take weeks to produce, with many European settlers making commentary on the fact that it was too much effort for the outcome. Trail also mentions in the guide the value of sugar, but little desire to undertake its production. In this regard, settlers more often purchased maple sugar products created from indigenous producers rather than making it themselves. As Trail says, if the settler has resolved upon making sugar, it was a process where most of the labor fell to the women of the household. In the backwoods, the women do the chief of the sugar making. It is rough work and fitter for men, but Canadians think little of that. I've seen women employed in stronger work than making sugar. I've seen women underbrushing and even helping to lay up and burn fallow. The beauty of having maple sugar on hand is that you can use it as a sweetener all throughout the year, even to make cookies in the winter. The title alone makes me believe that these were quick cookies to prepare if you had unexpected guests over for tea. Furthermore, they don't take that long to make as you can cook them in a frying pan, unlike a bake kettle or bake oven, which anyone would have access to. So grab a cup of tea and some tea cakes and join me for the taste test. So I've got my tea cakes hot off the griddle and I'm going to try them. So basically with the flour and the butter, they're kind of just like shortbread cookies. Mmm. But the maple adds something so nice to it. And the caraway seeds as well. You don't really see a lot of caraway in contemporary cooking. So having that in a shortbread cookie is very, very different. The maple is also a really nice, subtle sweetness. It's not very overpowering, but it's definitely the flavor is there. Cheers to winter baking, and thank you for joining me on today's episode. Hope to see you again soon. Holly, you're muted right now. Thank you. <laughs> um, what I was, let's do that again. What I found really interesting about preparing this recipe was that you actually make the cookies in a frying pan. And the reason being was that almost every settler would have had a frying pan, but not so much a bake oven or bake kettle, or as we might be more familiar with the term Dutch oven. And the reason being is that those things are heavy. Even if you have a little one like that, it it's it it's heavy and it's not going to be the first thing someone's going to pick to take on a ship across the ocean with them. So cookies in a frying pan, you can still cook them in a frying pan on a modern oven. It works just as fine. And it's just one of those really bizarre techniques that show up when you work with historic materials. So... <laughs>
After months of researching and producing and being involved with this project, I have learned some lessons, thank goodness, because that is what anyone would hope when you've been undertaking a project like this. And I wanted to share them with you because I think it really speaks to the kind of stuff that you can learn when you do an immersive project like this, and especially when you're working with culinary history materials. And I framed these lessons in two different ways. The first group of lessons are more related to the space of the historic kitchen, while the other is more about what I learned from doing the research and looking at these materials and the platform. So number one was inhabiting the space of the Fitzpatrick kitchen. Like you saw at the end of the episode, I had a chance to work with Lang Pioneer Village in Peterborough, Ontario, which is about three hours from Ottawa. The reason being is because it was a lot more challenging to find a functioning hearth in the Ottawa area than I thought. So I kind of had a bit of a radius that was kept going further and further afield until I was able to strike up a partnership with Lang and they've been really amazing and very student friendly. And so working in the Fitzpatrick kitchen is one of the sort of the middle generation of farmer homes. So there's the Fife cabin, which is first generation farmer, Fitzpatrick kitchen, which is the second generation, and then the Milburn house, which is the third. And the Fitzpatrick uh, home belonged to a family of Irish immigrants who, for Michael Fitzpatrick, the sort of patriarch of the family, was a tenant farmer back in Ireland. So they were very much rural agricultural um, folks. So the experience of cooking in that kind of historic kitchen, it can be restful, it can be mindful and investing, you know, the time in your day to be able to produce baked goods or meals can be a really satisfying experience, almost meditative even. Um, but this isn't my life. And being able to work like this in a kitchen for a day allows me to escape and kind of have a dedicated space to cook and experiment. But by the end of the day, my feet are killing me, my back as well, and a bunch of other muscles I didn't even know I had. So when taking this experience as a whole, these brief moments, they get me as close as possible to the experiences of our ancestors, but more importantly, remind me that it was work. And framing this work as a job, as labor, uh, takes this history outside of what we so often hear, it's just what women did. And the kitchen, you know, is a super important part of the home. It's the heart of the home. And for the most part, it was a woman's domain. So they were laid out and designed with the needs of the cooks in mind and evolved throughout time with these considerations as new technology was invented and in ways that could be improved for those who use the space most. And the more chances I get to cook in these spaces, the better I get at nav navigating this space, which is largely foreign to us. It's so different from a modern kitchen, even though all the same elements are there. So that leads me to the next lesson, which was developing my creative thinking and problem solving. And like I said, so many of the things that I've been working on with this project are all skills that take a lot of practice. And so when you enter a simulated space like a historic kitchen, you're forcing your mind to work differently as these new sets of challenges are presented to you. And this also comes into play when doing the research and trying to expand the pool of sources I can use to deepen what I'm bringing to the table around this subject matter. And the last thing I'd say in this category is really about thinking practically and my sense of spatial awareness. Managing a historic kitchen requires a lot of different skills than managing a modern one. So when I, I would drive to the site from Ottawa, when I'd arrive on site, I first things first, do an inspection and start the fire. Then I would take my costume and I would change into my outfit, which had all of the layers. So I'm cooking in a corset every time. Um, I've got moccasins on and I've got sort of a work dress. One is from the 1850s and one is from the early 1860s. So they're all fairly compressed in the same sort of decade. Then I would go uh, and feed the fire and then set up the space. So bring out my cooking bowls, my recipes, set up my camera and all that kind of stuff. And basically, once that's done, uh, I'm ready to go and start filming. So getting the hearth ready in the background is one of those new ways I had to navigate this type of kitchen and because I'm cooking in it for the entire day. So managing the fire, managing my wood pile and all those kinds of things. But obviously at home, we come home, we turn on the stove burner and it's ready to go. We can cook. Trying to do dishes as well was another challenge in a room without a sink or running water. 
trying to figure out what to pack and bring to the location only having seen it once and compacting my filming equipment and other peripherals all got me thinking more practically, especially in a house that has no electrical outlets. So bringing five changes of batteries for my camera just in case and bringing a, um, a music stand holder to hold my um, teleprompt software. So all of those things overall, like these are the kinds of skills that you develop when being faced with these kinds of challenges or undertaking these kinds of projects. And then on the other hand, there's the lessons that I learned from researching the content itself and working with a social media platform like YouTube. Catherine Partrail and her works have been studied by literary scholars, historians, and a variety of academics for years. And thankfully, this means that there's a large library of sources that I can draw from in my own research, but it's also a challenge to figure out what new questions I can ask of this material that has been looked over so many times. And how can I look at these sources differently than those who have studied it before me? So I'm really pleased with the direction that I took, as a lot of what I wanted to study was influenced by settler indigenous relationships and foodways. And to be able to demonstrate kind of that history and that story in my own way of, so of storytelling on social media. And furthermore, the medium of film is going to get a very different message across than text. And for many, it's a much more entertaining and accessible way to learn. For me, being so involved with these sources for years makes it feel like this material is like something that everybody should know. Um, but often I have to take a step back and recognize that a lot of people who are coming to my channel, they aren't Canadian. I have a lot of American viewers who watch this content and they've never heard of Catherine Parr Trail before or the sort of Canadian focus. So it's really interesting to kind of see how I'm coming into this um, and how my viewers are coming into it as well. And working with a social media platform also introduces a new set of challenges that a more traditional approach doesn't. So being able to see my project have a life in real time has been an amazing feeling to see people respond to it and watch it as soon as an episode goes up. And I get a lot of comments and that really shows how curious my audience is and hearing you know, which recipes they wanna try or if they learned a new technique. And I've also gotten a lot of comments about people who see my episodes and it reminds them of childhood memories. And they often share these stories in the comment section. And that's been really interesting to see how this content can really connect a lot of people over different countries and over different times. But on the other hand, uh, when I started the project, I had a very slowly growing channel, probably 500 um, subscribers and less people who were coming regularly. So then I start posting the project and my channel was growing way faster than I ever thought. And it's great because the more people who get to see it, they get to engage with the content, but it also meant that I was being seen. <laughs> I really wasn't sure how that, it made me feel really weird to kind of be kind of, yeah, seen and um, criticized. And even though it's exactly what I expected and I wanted to get a lot of feedback, it was kind of difficult to adjust to that way of interacting with people online. So the relationship that social media changes the relationship between the presenter and the viewers was something that I had to and I'm still getting used to as the project uh, sort of continues on. And the last piece is also seeing how my skills in filming, editing and using the platform have improved. Uh, like I mentioned, I first started making educational content on my YouTube channel when I was in my second year of my undergrad. So there's been a lot of improvement since then. And having that visual representation throughout time of how that has changed has been really cool and very valuable. Definitely that one's a bit more of a self-reflected lesson, but it's it's nice to see a bit of encouragement as you, you kind of track your own progress over time and you're like, wow, hey, I've I've changed. I've developed some skills. I did the animations, which is not something I ever would have thought I would have done, but it, this project kind of, you know, it makes you figure out ways to stylize it and, and do all that kind of fun stuff. So what's coming up next? Uh, what is going to happen with the project? First off, leading off from that feedback piece is that I intentionally left some of the future episodes undefined because I wanted to see what my viewers were interested in seeing from me. I get a lot of comments about you know, questions about certain techniques or asking if I could give more specifics. 
But then I have other people who leave comments about stuff that they would be really curious seeing if there's any representation of certain ingredients in the guide or things along those lines. And a lot of what people have suggested were already recipes and topics that I was planning. Um, but I've also had some really interesting suggestions that I'm working on developing into scripts to kind of have something that the audience can feel reflected in um, and know that I, I am listening and I'm also curious about what they're curious about. So how can I bring my perspective to that? So two out of the next four episodes will basically focus entirely on audience feedback and what they're interested in seeing. The next thing that I'm working on is the finale. <laughs> so the last sort of episode of the project. And I have to say, I'm really excited for this one because I'm hoping to do two recipes instead of just one. And I'm gonna really lean into the target audience of the guide itself because it was intended to be an all-in-one book for female immigrants to Canada. There's a story there, especially speaking to the histories of immigrant um, cooking in Canada. It's a really long history and it's a really beautiful history to see how it's evolved over time. So in it, um, Catherine Partrail mentions a lot of foods brought over by Scottish and Irish immigrants, and in addition, of course, to the British. And so Irish culinary history is actually the direction that I'm hoping to take this in because it's something I've started to take an interest in uh, drawing from my own family history. But this exploration has been really fascinating to dive into, and I haven't been able to find a lot of specifics around Irish Canadian culinary history. Uh, Scottish Canadian, yes, there's been some research done into that, but Irish Canadian culinary history, not so much. And Irish culinary history in Ireland is a growing field as well, and there's a lot of really interesting work that's coming out of culinary historians over there. So Irish culinary history has quite a few similarities to British culinary history. They're sharing the same cookbooks and things like that, but it also does have its own differences and of course its own uh, complex histories. So I wanted to try and highlight, or I will be trying to highlight these differences and to kind of talk about this idea that not all settler experiences in Canada were the same. I feel like when we kind of look at this content, um, normal, is sort of the experiences of many of the British settlers, but Irish settlers who are coming over are having a lot of different things um, influencing what their experiences look like. And food is one of those things. So there isn't one portrait of a settler woman that can be painted. And one of the key influences of your experience in Canada largely comes from your country of origin and sort of that other background in history. So I'm really excited to be working on that <laughs> kind of topic and starting to research a bit more into what Irish Canadian culinary history, that's a mouthful, <laughs> um, what that kind of looks like here and how that story can be told. And then finally, uh, what happens when the project is done? The videos will naturally remain public and on my channel, so they're freely available for anyone to watch. And like I mentioned, there are four more episodes that I have left to research and film. And mainly what I want to continue doing is things like this, uh, working on YouTube, doing talks as, you know, as an aside to my main career, but using tools like this really makes history easy for people to find. And that's something that's really important to me. And the other thing too is a bit of, like I mentioned, I had a lot of struggles finding a location to film. And having grown up in Toronto, there's almost every, actually, yes, every hearth at the historic buildings in Toronto work and people cook on them. And there's volunteers that have years of experience cooking on fires. And I thought naively that anywhere I went in Ontario would be exactly the same. And no matter where I went, there'd be a functioning hearth for me to play with. Um, that is not the case. So I'm hoping that in a little bit of a way, the project can be a form of advocacy for really supporting our local historic sites that do have hearths or maybe have hearths but they haven't they've been cold a bit too long so hopefully people can watch the videos they can learn the techniques and they can go to their historic site and say hey we want to maybe do a project or people at historic sites will be reinvigorated to work with culinary history materials for a bit and you know there's a lot of interest uh, in our communities as well as online for this kind of history and this kind of content as food has long been something that connects people across cultures and across time. So I'm hoping that even when the project ends, it will continue to have a bit of a life and be a reference and a resource for people in the future. 
So before wrapping up, um, I hope you all can get excited with me about what's coming next. And I actually wanted to leave you off with a sneak peek for episode seven. Uh, it's a bit of a milestone as it will be the last episode that I released before my thesis defense. And this recipe would have been made in homes that may have experienced poverty, a poor harvest, or limited cash flow or other such similar circumstances. It was designed to have limited ingredients to be able to feed your family in times of need. And I really wanted to demonstrate a recipe like this to try and show the wide spectrum of recipes and the reasons that they were cooked. So without further ado, a sneak peek for episode seven. Right. And with that, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who came out tonight and thank you to the Osgood Township Museum for hosting me. Um, if you'd like to see more of the series yourself, my channel is By Golly Miss Holly, or you could look up the Backwoods Kitchen. And please try out some of the recipes for yourself. Uh, there's some really interesting flavors and some really interesting techniques that I think are really enjoyable. I know that I've enjoyed them all so far. And feel free to yeah, peruse my website. All of that information is on there. Send me an email if you need a recipe translated or uh, <laughs> anything else. Uh, my inbox is always open. So thank you again to the museum and thank you all for being able to come out tonight. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Holly. I learned a lot. Um, in the history department at Carleton, we have been joking for a long time that we wanna do a viewing party of Holly's project. So this was a little bit of a sneak peek for me. Um, so it was very exciting. So just a reminder that the chat is open for any questions or comments about the presentation. We, um, I just wanted to apologize for not having closed captions available for this Zoom, but they will be available on the YouTube recording. Um, and then with that, I will go to the first question. If I can find it in this long chat. Um, so the first question was, I'm really intrigued by the relationship between maple sugar and abolition. Could you speak to how you came across this thread? Yeah, so that was a really interesting one, actually. Um, this came about, I've volunteered and worked in historic kitchens for a while. And this is something that people, members of the public who were coming into the site, they would ask me. And it was one of those things that I was like, huh? I've never heard of that before. And it, it's happened more than once. So when it came to working with, a, you know, a recipe that used maple sugar, that's kind of when I decided, let me look into this. Because it's one of those things that I was like, maybe it might be a little bit true. Eh, I'm not sure. And so I was able to find some information about this. Um, the manuscript, or sorry, the document that I used uh, in the episode was a agricultural manual from an American um, sort of farmer, farmer's almanac kind of thing. And so he really speaks very plainly to this idea. But other abolitionists uh, from England, a lot of Quaker abolitionists there, have been calling for sugar boycotts for decades. So this idea of boycotting sugar, it was a very real thing and an action that abolitionists did take if possible. But this idea that Canada was naturally abolitionist because of the relationship with maple sugar, it's not something that I could find a direct link to. So kind of looking at how that myth or that idea was you know, perpetuated almost, or at least in a way that audiences or people who were coming to the museum were asking me about, it was something that I'd never heard of before. So I wanted to dig my, dig my teeth into that excuse the pun, but look into that a little bit further and try to see what I could find. And unfortunately, not much. 
But there is definitely a history there regarding sugar and abolition and the kind of wedge of maple sugar is an interesting one, but not as tangible as what I'd been hearing from others. That's fantastic. Um, the next question is curious to know if you have cooked wearing stays. Having done with and without, my lesson was that stays got rid of the backache as they give you the support. Yes. Yeah. So I've cooked in uh, Regency short stays, so 1812, and I wear an 1860s corset when I'm cooking. And it does help. It does definitely give a lot of structure, but I think just spending five hours cooking in a kitchen at one go back to back usually I do two five hour days um and hauling the cast iron and hauling everything around it it gets to you and I'm used to wearing a corset it's not it's not uncomfortable for me my body has gotten used to that for sure but it 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 takes a toll on you in a really unexpected way um, the next question is on the subject of cast iron pans slash bake kettles, you mentioned choosing to haul them across an ocean with you. Were artisans making cast iron tools harder to come by compared to artisans making forged steel tools or tin tools? Yeah, so tin tools in Canada, super common. You could find tin products anywhere. Um, but cast iron was being produced here. And the industry was thriving for quite some time up until the 1880s or 1890s and then American producers slowly started taking over but it's more so um, the expense it was really expensive and if you're coming from England or Scotland or Ireland like you cannot bring a lot with you again it depends on your class what kind of ticket are you able to buy um are you a refugee for instance the the Irish famine had saw a lot of refugees coming to Canada so they are limited in what they can bring so it really depends on what you can afford to bring over, what kind of space you have. And if there's an option to just buy it in Canada, if you're not emotionally attached to that thing, you might as well just get it once you're over. It would be more important to bring things like dry provisions, for instance, you didn't know where your next meal was necessarily going to be coming from. So if you could carry some food with you, that would take precedence over some of these bigger, heftier tools. But a bake kettle, Dutch oven, bake oven, those tools are incredible. A lot of homes were not built with ovens built in. So you had to bring this portable one with you. So out of everything, it is my favorite tool. I bring it with me everywhere I can because it can be a frying pan. It could be a, you know, a stew pot. It could be an oven. You could bake bread in it. So it's an extremely multi-purpose tool. But once again, not something that necessarily everyone would have or at least have right at the gate. Um, next question, was it a conscious decision to not talk about the recipe or techniques, but rather just show a part of each process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't really get into the recipe itself because that is something that anyone anyone can read. You know, I've translated the recipe, so it's there. The book as well that I'm working from, the edition that I'm working from is available in a lot of libraries and as an ebook. So I do give the listing for where you can find the recipe and what page it is. But I think for me, what was more important, knowing that that information was accessible, was trying to tell more of the story and give a bit more of the research behind what was kind of the, all the stuff happening around the recipe itself, the stuff that was a little harder to look into unless you were really going to do some dedicated research for it. Um, but it's one of those things that I know some content creators, they do have sort of like the measurements on screen or they talk a little bit more about the recipe. But in the interest as a creative decision, in the interest as well of keeping the episodes a little bit shorter too. Um, yeah, that was something that I, I had to decide on fairly early. But um, yeah, it kind of, it's just one of those, I, I guess, a creative decision more than anything. And then we have a food question. How does boiling apples and sugar preserve them? Yeah, so that's a really interesting one. Um, basically, a sugar syrup, if it's two parts sugar to one part water, is a super standard method of preservation. It's essentially a simple syrup. And the sugar acts as a preservative. So when there's that ratio of two parts sugar, one part water, it's enough to create the syrup, but you're not introducing too, too much liquid to start like a molding or decomposing process. So basically you are smothering the apples with sugar and you're leaving them in a jar and it's just, it's a really beautiful color. It's a really good flavor too. There's a lot of other, you know, spices you're adding into it, essence of lemon, 
So if you like molasses, that's a perfect recipe for your anyone who likes molasses, but you're smothering them in sugar and nothing is going to happen to them. Um, with that in mind, though, my background is not in preserving or canning. So I, when I made my recipe, I did two versions of it, the recipe I tested at home and then the recipe I made at Lang. And the recipe I tested at home, I left it on my counter for about two months and it was fine. It was totally fine. She says you can leave it all throughout the winter and nothing will happen. But I'm of the mind where I haven't had formal training in preserving or canning. So I'm not going to I'm not going to test that. It's something I need to definitely look more into. And I, I did mention that in that episode. I was like, mm, try this if you like, but please be aware that it's not a modern technique. So that those sort of modern safety standards that have been tried and tested at this point, not really the same for this particular recipe. Yeah, I know. I remember I tried, I think you sent me an apple butter recipe that I tried yeah. making that I was very, had a very fun time doing it. It was my first time doing any sort of preserving or anything like that. So that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, are there any more questions anybody would like to put in the chat? There's a lot of comments, a lot of thank yous. Congratulations. Is a wonderful presentation? Thank you. Um, I've got one here. It's, uh, thanks, Holly. Can't wait for the next episode. My question is, are there moments when you are cooking when you feel a real connection to the creator of the recipe? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things where th the days that I was cooking at Lang, um, a couple of the days were off-season days, but the site was open to the public. And a couple days, it was totally closed. And so I was just, it was just me in the kitchen with with the cookbook and the fire and that experience, like I mentioned, is very meditative. It's very mindful because you're dedicating your whole day to doing this. Um, as for a connection with the author, she lived half an hour away from where the museum is currently located. So being in that location specifically, and it's serendipitous how it worked out, being able to cook so close to where the book was written. So kind of being able to, to see you know, where she was and where she was writing from and that perspective and being in a kitchen that was probably really similar to hers, or at least being from an, an immigrant family's kitchen for her target audience. So it's possible that book could have been in that kitchen, you know, years ago. But I think that connection really comes from being able to cook those recipes and doing the research into looking into, well, why are they cooking farmer's rice, for instance, or why are you preserving these apples or why are you making a drink with vinegar <laughs> and kind of looking into more of those contexts that's what really connects me to and then being in the kitchen going through the motions and kind of reading these instructions and following them to the best of my ability um especially when there's like question marks over what does she mean by this what is that food where can i get that what does this term mean so absolutely. And I think that largely comes from being in the space, doing the same recipes and really just allowing yourself to not not think about anything else, not feeling rushed and just taking the time to really enjoy the process. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, the next question sort of touched on what you just left off was, has it ever been difficult finding the ingredients for some of the recipes? Yeah, for the most part, it hasn't been too bad. The one that really tripped me up, and this is a, an episode gonna that's going to come out after my defense, it was for yeast. And I'm reading it, and she says a cup of yeast. And I'm like, surely you don't mean the dry, like, Fleischmann's bread yeast packages? Of course not. But what do you mean by yeast? And a cup of it. So I'm reading through some of the other stuff in the book and she's got a lot of information on leaveners. So using um, brewers hops. So if you had a beer or brewer in your town, you could go to them and buy the hops uh, from, from them or brewer's yeast and making all kinds of leaveners. And then I was like, yeast, leavener. She's just using another word for a leavener of some kind. So then I was kind of figuring out, okay, well, what, what do I want to do with this? Now that I figured it out, it's a leavener. It's something that's going to make these pancakes rise. Well, what do I currently have? I have a sourdough starter in my fridge. I've named, his name is Gronk, Gronk the <laughs> sourdough starter. But I had that already. And that's exactly the kind of bacterial leavener 
this was before chemical leaveners were invented or just on the cusp of when they were invented. So she's going to be working with a bacterial leavener. And I was like, I have that. So I put Gronk to use and I, I fed, I fed him. I fed the sourdough starter over the course of two days. So it would grow and grow and grow. So I'd have enough for a cup of yeast, a cup of leavener. But that was the only one that kind of tripped me up. Everything else is fairly apple sugar, maple sugar, cinnamon, nutmeg. A lot of these things we still have in our pantries or other ingredients like caraway, you can still buy that fairly easily. But it was really that sort of thing that tripped me up because she uses a lot of terms in general. Yeast is one of those things where it's interchangeable with barm. It's interchangeable with leavener. Um, Canadian and American are also interchangeable to her. So sometimes she'll be talking about, oh, this is the way they do it in, or this is the way the Yankees do it. And it's like, wait, do you actually mean people from the States or are you just using this term to describe Canadians? So <laughs> all that to say, um, the sourdough starter, yeast, leavener, barm situation was the only one that tripped me up. But otherwise, it's really just getting to know her writing style to figure out how to piece together those elements. And then eventually I came to my conclusion that, yes, I could use sourdough starter and it would be totally fine and accurate to the recipe. That's, that's really good. I really that was a very fun story. Um <laughs> Next question, could you speak to what you have learned about Indigenous recipes or cooking approaches in your research? Oh my goodness. Um, honestly, more than I thought. I went into this trying, you know, I was like, okay, everything that Catherine Partrail is really writing about is very unique to the experience of being in Canada. And other cookbooks had been published in Canada by this point in time, but a lot of culinary historians sort of regard the Female Emigrant's Guide as the first completely Canadian cookbook. It was intended for an audience coming to Canada and it was using Indigenous foodways and adapting them to suit a settler's palate. So it's the first time that that sort of commentary was happening. In every episode, there's been a connection. Sometimes they're tangential. In the first episode where I talk about raspberry vinegar, the drink, um, I talk a lot about sort of like raspberries and why you might be using raspberries in the kitchen. And of course, mentioning that blueberries, cranberries, yeah, blueberries and cranberries are like the only native berry plant in Canada and the others sort of came. But for thousands of years, berries have been a huge staple ingredient in many indigenous diets like across Canada. So that's sort of one of those things where it's, there's a connection there, but it's it's a little more surface level. But then other recipes, like when I was working with the venison soup, she talks about a really interesting practice, which for indigenous people of the time, um, especially like, so for the Anishinaabe, which is where, you know, her relationships were coming from, this is the concept of reciprocity. And for her, she writes about it because it's a bit strange to her, where essentially a group of hunters, they're returning from hunting. And um, they basically, they go into her house and they stay the night. And in exchange for staying the night, they offer some of the freshly caught game. And she's writing about this because she thinks it's odd. It's something she's like, oh, this is normal in Canada. This is this is what happens. You know, um, if the hunters stay the night, they'll leave us something. Or sometimes if we're engaging in trade, we'll offer uh, flour in exchange for wild rice or things like that. So this reciprocal relationship was something that absolutely characterized the, the social relationships nation to nation, but also settler indigenous relationships as well. And so when you look at venison, this was absolutely a, an item that was gifted to settlers in a reciprocal agreement. But when the settlers were arriving, a lot of the reciprocity comes from beliefs of the treaties that were being signed. In the Peterborough area, there were a significant number of treaties that were signed that displaced the Michisagi, um around the area quite a bit, reduced the land that they had to live on, and also reduced quite a number of the traditional hunting and fishing grounds. So when you look at that in context, these treaties were signed 30 years before Catherine Partrail ever arrived in Canada. So for her neighbors, the Michisagi neighbors, this is something that they are following because it was in their treaty agreement, ideas of reciprocity. But for her, it never comes up. She has no idea. And she's just writing about it in her book. So when you look at these relationships between foodways and these sort of social relationships, it's everywhere that you look. Venison, uh, berries, apples as well. Crab apples, there were 
hundreds of acres across North America of indigenous crabapple orchards well before uh, European contact. But that story, crabapples, we we see them on the street rotting in the summer. And crabapples don't really have that same sort of importance in our society anymore, but they once did. And that relationship as well, preserving apples. She says you can use any apple, a crab apple would do. It's a, it's a just one throwaway sentence, but it was enough for me to look into it a little bit more because I'm like, well, crab apples, those are native to Canada, native to North America. What's the story there? Surprisingly, a lot deeper than you would think. So because I'm focusing it through her writing, it is really based on a lot of these settler recipes, but every single one has a connection to a longer history or even a current history for when the book was published relating to treaties or relating to the displacement of waterways and hunting and fishing grounds. So there's a lot there and she hints to a lot of it and she's very forthcoming with a lot of her observations. So her writing is a great place to start for my project, which is very focused on her cookbook, but for looking into other things for this time period as well and sort of tracking that history of how indigenous foodways significantly impacted what settlers were eating and how their diets were shaped. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I think that is it so far for questions. So Holly's information is up on the screen and um you'll be able to look up the Backwoods Kitchen should you want to try any recipes. I know I'm going to. Um, I would like to thank you all for coming and I would really like to thank Holly again for spending her time with us this evening and sharing her knowledge. It was great to get to see what you're working on and I'm very excited to see what you have in store for the future. So thank you again, Holly, for coming and thank you all of you for attending. Um, this will be available on our YouTube in the next coming days.